So now we're going to talk about um, genetic correlation and, uh, and partitioning. So we're going we're gonna to start with genetic correlation. Now I'm, I'm going to talk more broadly about a term that, that, um, that we call genetic overlap. And so, so a lot of traits have, have really similar genetic architecture. That is, a, if, if we find a SNP that is causal for some trait, like educational attainment, um, it's, it's more likely, once we found it for education attainment, we, we might think that it's more likely to also be asso associated with things like um, cognitive performance or, or a bunch of other traits, you know, the, uh, schizophrenia. Um, and so, so we maybe want to get an estimate of, of how, how strong that relationship is. You know, what, if we do find a SNP for one trait, how, how likely is it that it's going to also be causal for the other? Um, just as just a, as a vocab that I don't think has has come up, we haven't defined specifically. So there's if the 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 state where one SNP is associated with a variety of phenotypes. That's called pleiotropy. So if someone says, "Oh, that's, there's pleiotropy," it means that that genes do more than one thing, and um, and so because there's pleiotropy, that's why there's going to be genetic overlap. Um, and so why why might we care about overlap? Well, you know, it might help us untangle complicated causal relationships. So if we see that all of the SNPs that are important for education are also important for for schizophrenia, then uh, you know, I might say, oh, so those those two things have have a genetic a genetic relationship. You know, um, if we see that depression is is uh, highly genetically correlated with neuroticism, then we're like, okay, yeah, the the, the genetic you know, additive contribution to, to those two traits is, is similar. And so that can help us as we're thinking about what might be causing both of them. Um, it also can help us prioritize causal pathways. Um, and so, uh, so like let's, this, this is sort of related to maybe the proxy phenotype method. And so let's say that we know that, um, that education and cognitive performance are, are highly genetically correlated, but we don't have very large samples for cognitive performance. Well, if we know that they're highly related, then we could you know, limit the space over which we're looking at the genome by just taking you know, SNPs that are associated with educational attainment um, above a certain level and look for the association with cognitive performance there. And, and as a result, we don't have to do as large uh, a multiple testing correction because we're doing fewer tests. Um, you know, also if we know that things are related and we're trying to like figure out how, you know, it, it'll just point us in the right direction. How does, Sorry? How does that differ um, from candidate genes? So I think that when, at least historically, when people have said candidate gene, it was based on sort of a, a, a theoretical biological relationship. And so he said, oh yeah, this, this gene, we think it has to do with this, and so we're going to, um, we're going, you know, we're going to test, test for that. Whereas when I say proxy phenotype, it's, it's less of a theoretical relationship that we're using to select, but an empirical one. Um, it's an yeah. Great, and so there's kind of two, so when we say overlap, there's sort of two ways to, to think about it. So one's enrichment and one's genetic correlation. And so, so enrichment is, is this idea of kind of the proxy phenotype method. You know, are SNPs that are important for, for phenotype A also important for, for phenotype B? And so we could do this test. We're just going to take the SNPs uh, with a p-value of less than p naught, and we're going to test them in, in a GWAS for phenotype B. Um, and so, so that, that could be pretty successful in seeing like if, you know, do the SNPs in phenotype B in that subset, um, are they, you know, more likely to be more significant? That's sort of the, the very you know, high view question. Um, but there's a few technical questions. First off, um, how would you pick the threshold? Are we just going to look at um, SNPs that are genome-wide significant? Or should we look maybe uh, lower in the distribution? Um, how do you deal with LD? So let's say you have two SNPs and they're highly correlated with each other, but this SNP is really important for phenotype A, but not at all important for phenotype B, and this SNP is really important for phenotype B, but not for phenotype A. If we just compared GWAS summary statistics, we would say, oh yeah, these are both important, and so these traits might be related. Um, but when it comes down to the actual, um, you know, the actual effect of those particular SNPs, they're, they're not related at all. And so, so we should keep, keep in mind that, you know, we're, you know, we have this sense, when we have GWAS summary statistics, you shouldn't think SNP, you should think sort of like region around the SNP. Um, 
Uh, there's another question. Oh, yeah? That's a, that's a question that I don't know the answer to, actually. D does anyone, <laughs> uh, d is there anyone with a bio background who knows this? I was wondering this just the other day. So the question is, um, if, if you have a, a gene that you know is important for some phenotype, um, are other genes that are going to be important to that phenotype maybe going to be nearby, like on the same chromosome or nearby, um, on, uh, yeah, either close to each other on the chromosome or just on the chromosome? Yeah, yeah. So I guess for expression, we know that there's some local localness. But yeah, James. I wish. I wish. I think one way of explaining how most of the genes that regulate gene expression are nearby, but there can be some genes that are yeah that are far away. At least as regulation. Dan. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as, as you and I were talking about the other day, Patrick, that for the, um, the acetylcholine nicotinic receptor genes, they tend to be close to each other. Um, um, so those are ones that are associated with smoking behaviors. But for other things, um, you know, certainly for, for you know, educational attainment, there are hits over the entire genome. And there's, you know, so, um, uh, I don't know. If, is it, I wonder if there's local correlation, but it doesn't seem to be. I mean, if it's highly polygenic. Um, uh, I guess my question is more related to more uh, directly ones with direct biological pathways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I wish I knew the answer as well, and someone maybe does, but I, I don't know. I and mean, it's relevant for a lot of the lot of the things that we do. Like remember how I told you one of the assumptions in LC, LD score regression is that these betas are independent, and if genes that are important for specific things tend to be close to each other, that also means that they're in high LD with each other, and so it might it might break, it, you know, might violate the assumptions of LD score regression. So so I, I, I don't know the answer, but I wish I did. Um, so here's another question. So like let's let's say we did um, was was that a question or was that a stretching? Okay. Um, and so let's let's say that we you know we have our education our 74 education associated SNPs, and then we looked them up in a height GWAS, and we find that all of them are associated with height. You know, do we do we think that that is a signal that the two traits are are strongly related? I'm going to say no. Who can give me a reason why we might not expect that? You might not expect. It you yeah. So so you would you wouldn't want to interpret the fact that every single education SNP is is uh, is associated with height as well. Yeah, so I guess the direction could be one thing. What, what else might we think about? Because direction, if it's associated, it could go in. OK, yeah, yeah. But we're just looking for general enrichment. We don't, we're not thinking about direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if that's the case, then we actually do think they're related. I guess so. so. Yeah, so I guess maybe I should have picked something that are unrelated. Let's say there's traits that, that aren't. I mean, I guess, I guess maybe I shouldn't make you keep guessing, but maybe it's good that you were thinking. Um, but height's really polygenic, right? So why is that relevant? EA is really polygenic. Yeah, EA is really polygenic, but, but specifically height being, you know, EA, if we had a trait that wasn't polygenic, let's say there was only one gene, and, and it was the only gene, and we find that that gene also is important for height. Yeah, because a random SNP drawn from the genome is likely to be associated with height, right? And so we should keep that in mind also when we're doing these tests. So we've got to think, what's, what's, what's the, you know, what is our expected significance? And, and so, because we're talking about, you know, are things more significant than we expect? You have to ask the questions, what do we expect? And saying that we expect null, uh, you know, that, that it should be null is maybe not right. Um, there's also a question of one-sided or two-sided test, which gets to this idea, you know, is, do, or do we want to think about the sign? 
or not. If, if we see a positive effect in education, if we just want to see if that leads to positive effects in height, then that, that's a one-sided test. But if we just want to say, do we expect a large effect in height, and we don't care if it's negative or positive, then that would be a two-sided test. And so that's, that's just a decision that we need to make. Um, and so here, here are some, um, uh, some examples of kind of the thing I told you. So we take the 74 education SNPs, we're about out of time, but I'll, we'll stop at the end of the overlap stuff. Um, and then I want to see if it is associated with a GWAS on the size of your, of, of your thalamus in your brain. And so the 45 degree line is what we would expect to see um, if, if they were all null. Um, and so we see that, you know, it does sort of peel away uh, from, from null. So, so there are more, you know, it does seem that there might be a little bit of, of extra signal relative to the null, but we can test the, um, how much there is enrichment there is based on how, how polygenic we think the trait is. And, and we, you know, we have a p-value of 0 0.08. And so we can't um, reject that you know, the amount of inflation that we're seeing is just due to chance. Um, however, if we look at the education SNPs in a GWAS of cognitive performance, you know, we start seeing it peel away like, pretty quickly. And our p-value there is, is 0 0.02, just based on you know, how, how significant are these relative to what we'd expect. If you look at schizophrenia, it peels away even more. Schizophrenia, I think, is a funny case. So if we look at, at um, cognitive performance, the sign concordance is 90%. So that means a SNP that increases education, you know, 90% of the time will also estimate it to increase cognitive performance. And so, you know, it's highly enriched. Schizophrenia, we see, you know, it's, it's highly, highly enriched. We can see just by looking at these points that there's a lot of enrichment. Um, however, um, the sign concordance is 51%, which means that a SNP that's associated with education, it's likely to be important for schizophrenia, but we can't really guess if it's going to be protective of schizophrenia or, or um, what's the opposite? It's more, more causal. It's going to be more likely to, to lead to schizophrenia. And so that's kind of a funny case. Um, so I think that we should break for lunch, and we can talk about genetic correlation briefly after lunch.